Right. Mm. Although we were um, born on the same day in okay. 1993, mm. uh, by an act of parliament, our roles are, are very um, different. Mm. Uh, the role of national medical stores is uh, basically a one of a supply chain. Mm. Uh, we are the quintessential medicine supply chain entity uh, that we have um, in the country. Um, to understand and appreciate the work that we do, you must have an understanding of what <coughs> supply chains are. Mm. And uh, these are essentially those um, processes, activities, organizations that facilitate uh, the provision of essential medicines uh, right from the innovators, uh, the manufacturers, down to the individual patients who consume them. Mm. Now, to do this, uh, national medical stores must be able to um, identify these items, quantify them, and procure them mm. in anticipation of what shall be demanded. We must be able to store these commodities so that we can supply them without interruption mm. and then make sure that we have the robust mechanisms in place mm. to make sure that we can distribute them on demand as and when okay. in the right quantity mm. and the right quality. Our sister agency, on the other hand, um, NDA. Yeah, mm. National Drug Authority, was, um, was put in place to regulate the sector mm. of, of essential medicines, basically. Uh, they have a role to make sure that, uh, first of all, there is availability of medicines in the country. And they've got to make sure that the medicines that we have in the country are safe and they are efficacious. That's just another word for, for effective. Mm, for effective. And, and they do this through the regulation of, uh, of the sector. Uh, so they do regulate uh, the importation, the export, manufacture, mm. and sale mm. of, of, of these medicines. And that is how we are different. So we are doing different roles, but there is a very tight relationship between us. Mm. Um, so as supply chain entity, uh, as ourselves, we basically are regulated by national drug authorities. So that is how we are able to ensure mm. that the medicines that we are providing for the population are actually safe um, by making sure that uh, the regulator is doing their part mm. in making sure that everything we receive, distribute, and even is used is um, of, of, of good quality mm. and that the regulator has played their part. Uh, how about joint medical stores? Is it called joint medical stores? Yeah. Yes. Mm. Joint medical stores mm. is, um, is a little older than the two of us, NDA and, and National Medical Stores. It, um, it was there much earlier and uh, it was a time when I think predominantly many of the health facilities in the country uh, were owned and operated um, under, by, by faith-based organizations. And uh, they were doing the role that we kind of do right now. So theirs is also supply chain, but it was specifically for uh, those faith-based facilities. Mm -hmm. So as government um, grew and matured, um, it saw it fit and proper that they have their own agency to serve the public facilities. So mm -hmm. we continue to work in the same space. Um, they provide commodities for faith-based facilities and uh, we do for the public facilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, even them, they are regulated by, by NDA. Yes, by NDA. Okay. So that's how we make sure that uh, everybody has a clear space mm -hmm. where they can work. The mandate is clear. And also, there is, uh, we can have some level of assurance that there is quality medicine mm. being used by Ugandans. How do you feel when you hear Ugandans say there is not enough medicine in hospitals and, and you are those um, responsible for uh, the supply, uh, as you talk about, and of course the stores itself? How do you feel when Ugandans say there is no medicine in hospital? Because this is a very common talk among us Ugandans, mm. especially those calling on TV, calling on radio, uh, discussing politicians everywhere. Mm. How do you feel when you are supposed to uh, have enough medicine? for all of us in the country it is disappointing I, I think uh, sometimes a bit frustrating uh, for some even heartbreaking um, because there is a lot of effort that is being put in, into this system to make sure that we have medicines available uh, for the public um, not only the public sector but even um, for the PNFPs like uh, I was speaking about JMS um, but you see, there are so many factors that contribute to the availability of medicines within a health facility. Um, one of them, first off, is that um, if me facilities are going to have enough medicines as uh, they will require, mm. there has to be some degree of, of, of planning mm. that is accurate. So we normally call this quantification mm. or forecasting of their needs. And uh, we try and support them to see how best they can articulate uh, what they believe will be their future needs and put them down on paper into plans that the warehouses like um, NMS can then source and uh, <coughs> provide for them on a regular basis. So that has to be done mm. very well and we try and support them there. But the other areas also are on the rational use of the medicines. We do have 
um, quite a limited uh, amount of, of funding uh, okay. for, for medicines. And uh, we need to make sure that we are very judicious in the way we use the resources that we have. Mm -hmm. We still have a culture of people taking a lot of medicines and using them even inappropriately, mm -hmm. self-medication, mm -hmm. and even using them for, for, for diseases for which they are not indicated. Mm -hmm. So you have also a lot of misuse and irrational use of the medicines that mm -hmm. contributes to sometimes what people may perceive to be a, a stock out. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you may actually have um, physicians actually requesting that patients go get medicine, which may not necessarily be required, and they say, oh, that one is not available, so the medicine is not there yet there's an alternative which is available mm. that they could have taken at the end of the day and to tie uh, those two together uh, we also need to make sure that we have commensurate funding uh, for these medicines here mm. so over the years um, government has been doing uh, I think what I believe to be a very uh, a very very good job mm. in increasing uh, the funding available for medicines just this financial year we've seen almost a 49 percent increase in uh, the budget available for for, for medicines at mm. national medical stores and it has been gradually increasing our partners also uh, development partners have also made sure that they support uh, government's efforts in making sure that we have medicines available for them mm. and uh, they have also stepped up their contribution so we have a lot of, of medicines coming through. And when you look at the total throughput that we have mm -hmm. um, in NMS, it is very difficult to understand where we can actually get uh, shortages from. Okay. Because um, I can tell you just for last financial year, we distributed um, commodities in excess of 1.3 trillion um, Uganda shillings worth of medicines to public health facilities. But mm. we sometimes do not see a commensurate decrease in, in, in the voices saying that they are not there. So there are other issues further down in the supply chain I think exactly. we need to address. Mm. Uh, perhaps at uh, the health facilities, we want to know how these medicines are being used and if the medicines are staying within the health facility and not escaping. Mm. And uh, I think that will go a long way in making sure that uh, we can have the medicines available. I think right now we are at a place where um, we may not necessarily need to put more medicines in directly, but I think control the way they are used and the way they are issued to the patients okay. so that only those who need them are getting them. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are no other channels where these uh, commodities may be escaping okay. uh, and going where they ought not to go. Okay. Yeah. Well, very important. Now, uh, whose discretion is it to decide which medicines are procured into the country? Procured into the country. Oh, yes. Whose uh, discretion is that? The, the Ministry of Health uh, does have uh, what we call an essential medicines list. Mm -hmm. So basically, this list describes the medicines which are permitted for use in the country. Mm -hmm. They also release what they call treatment guidelines. Mm -hmm. So they'll say if you have condition X, this is the treatment that you should be getting. Mm -hmm. So these two married together will give you a combination of the medicines that are permitted for use in the country. Mm -hmm. And then that is what also the regulator uses to make sure that uh, people who are importing or manufacturing items are actually doing so for products which are approved for use within the country. So there is a relationship there between the Ministry of Health and the regulator to make sure that only safe items are being mm -hmm. manufactured or imported or sold mm -hmm. or even exported to other countries as well. Yes, I, I appreciate that, but I'm also looking at um, district levels, for example. Yeah. Um, who decides what medicines come to a particular district? Uh, for example, you are NMS, mm -hmm. uh, you, you do all these, you supply, you, you procure. Mm. And, and how do we uh, decide and say um, so much medicine will go to uh, the referral hospital in um, the, the regional hospital in Soroti or mm -hmm. Masindi or elsewhere and stuff like that? Because at the end of the day, we normally hear NMS again say we need so much hundreds of millions mm -hmm. to actually mm -hmm. um, uh, ban the medicines possibly that have uh, expired. And, and the mm -hmm. question would be there are voices saying there are no medicines in the hospital, mm -hmm. but then the Okwari is actually looking for more money uh, mm -hmm. to destroy what we did not use. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What causes that? Okay, I, I think we need to I'll answer the first question uh, mm -hmm. that you asked about who decides what is uh, actually ordered um, at uh, facility level mm -hmm. it is actually the health facilities um, each of the facilities does have a budget mm -hmm. um, and they have an account mm -hmm. with national medical stores and against that account or budget they have with us mm -hmm. uh, they place orders and they draw down um, against that account mm -hmm. so essentially the money that is voted to NMS we just hold in trust uh, that money is essentially for the health facilities. So we do notify them at the beginning of uh, every financial year that uh, such and such amount is available for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, we develop procurement plans with them. Uh, this is where we try and sit down with them and say, okay, fine, what do you think your needs are for the whole financial year? Um, what type of medicine shall you require? Mm -hmm. So that we can also go and do the planning on our side, make sure we can have contracts in place so that we can order for these commodities. Mm -hmm. So that later when they order, 
they can be available. Mm -hmm. So to answer the question there, it is the facilities that actually plan mm -hmm. for this. Oh, right from the um, higher level institutions like um, Heart Institute and those doing specialized services all the way down to the health center too. They all do plan every year for how they intend or wish to utilize the money that uh, government has provided for them mm. within a financial year. Mm. So there are no medicines which show up um, by mistake. Mm. Okay, so, so, so that has to be appreciated. Uh, the second part of your question is that then how come do we find that uh, sometimes uh, we, we have instances where um, some medicines have not been used mm. and uh, they have to be banned. But uh, you need to appreciate one thing here is that uh, many, in fact all, of, of the medicines that uh, we, we distribute or even we use in the sector are perishable, just like food. And uh, one characteristic of perishable items is that uh, once they reach a date they beyond which they, yeah, they do expire. So the, the science that we are in is that we are trying to see how best we can anticipate what morbidity will look like further down the road and then see if, how we can make those medicines available uh, for those facilities as and when. But um, as we provide them, sometimes at the health facility level, you may have morbidity changing from time to time. So you may anticipate I'll get maybe 100 patients of uh, malaria every month, but all of a sudden you get maybe 10. Um, so what happens to the balance? So you, you have that possibility that you may have some of the commodities um, going unutilized. But then there's also the reverse. I mean, if I've planned for 10 and I get 20, you end up with um, a stock out on the other hand. So again, the issue of planning is, is very critical. Okay. And we are basically <coughs> They're trying to balance a coin um, on, on, on its side here because either side of it, you know, there is stock out on one side and you have um, expiries on the other. Okay. So the science we're trying to do here is a very delicate balancing act in making sure that our plans match as close as possible to what is actually materialized in the future. We cannot have perfect clarifiance of what will happen in the future, mm -hmm. six or seven months down the line, but we try as much as possible to do that. Mm -hmm. But also, um, in this industry that we are in, it is expected mm -hmm. that uh, we shall have some proportion of the medicines actually um, go to waste. Mm -hmm. It is not possible to buy all these medicines and have them all swallowed. Because we buy the medicine, but we're praying we never fall sick. Mm. And when we don't fall sick, we actually thank God. Mm. But uh, there are the medicines which are already exactly. been procured. So it's mm. kind of like an insurance sometimes. Mm. So what we try and do here is try and see how we can keep that waste to a small a minimum as mm. possible. Okay. So the industry standard uh, for wastage in, in the pharma sector at least is about 5% of mm. the total throughput that you have. Okay. So for every perhaps um, 100 million shillings worth of commodities I buy and push into the system, mm. I believe that there is a chance that 5% of them for the mobilities we've identified mm. may not actually um, get utilized. So mm. that is the standard we try and, and, and follow. But um, over the years, I think uh, NMS has done a very good job in mm. managing um, those expiries and the wastage okay. and uh, we have never exceeded half a percentage mm -hmm. uh, so you can compare five percent with 0.5 okay. so we are i don't know how many fold uh, mm -hmm. much less almost uh, th 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 that's a lot almost 10 times mm -hmm. lower than th th than the the standard available mm -hmm. which is very good but nevertheless when the commodities do um, get spoiled we have to find ways of making sure they do not get relabeled and public go again. Egg, yeah mm -hmm. and then also dispose into the environment lo wrongly we have to make sure that uh, we find proper and fit ways of making sure we can dispose them okay. safely mm. uh, for the environment and for the people as well. So okay. Well, very important. Now, uh, back to uh, the COVID fight here. We know that uh, the way to go now is uh, we're looking for vaccines and um, the explanations that we got for, first of all, having AstraZeneca in this country was because of, one, the costing itself, but secondly, um, its storage um, capacities. Yeah. And I want to know from you because expert analysis says um, the other uh, uh, vaccines, uh, Pfizer, Moderna, g and &G, and quite a number, mm. they, they require different storage uh, facilities. Do mm. we have them here? Because we're now moving into uh, finding vaccines from every arm. We, we mm. can't say we we'll rely on only AstraZeneca. We're now getting all the others. Mm. Does NMS now have the capacity? to store it gather um, vaccines if we got Pfizer into the country Moderna uh, AstraZeneca Sinovac and all these others yeah I, I think the decision at the beginning of the the pandemic to to actually go with AstraZeneca I think was well informed mm -hmm. you have to play to your strength in this business you do not play to areas where you do not have um, th yeah th that, that amount of strength and our strength has been in um, vaccines which we have been holding at two to eight for the greater period we also have capacity where we store vaccines up to minus 30 and even up to minus 85. Mm -hmm. uh, National medical stores 
holds um, Ebola vaccine, which goes all the way down to minus 85. Mm -hmm. And we have been storing this uh, for, for quite some years now. But this capacity is limited. And when you're looking at a program here where you want to have vaccines for more than 22 million Ugandans, mm -hmm. you, you have to use the most readily available and also not just the system that is available at the center, mm -hmm. but also one that is available at the districts and the health facilities. So the best fit in this scenario in terms of price, uh, temperature range, um, capacity at the districts, capacity at the health facilities, and also the training mm -hmm. of the health facilities in how to administer vaccines at 2 to 8 was the, was the AstraZeneca. Mm -hmm. But um, given that the global pandemic is not necessarily slowing down, mm -hmm. we're seeing that uh, with the variants coming along, now like with the Delta, mm -hmm. which we're seeing in many parts of the world, um, there is uh, a very, very sharp uh, increase in the demand for, 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 for the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is difficulty in sourcing it. Mm -hmm. So we have to widen our perspective a little bit mm -hmm. and not just look only at uh, the AstraZeneca that mm -hmm. may be available, but look at other options. So to do this, uh, we're very working very closely with our partners, um, mm -hmm. UNICEF and even with USAID. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to see how we can get uh, some additional mm -hmm. ultra cold chain capacity in the country and that will be in by the end of the month. Mm -hmm. We believe uh, we should be able to hold more than three million doses okay. of, um, of, the, of the ultra cold um, like the Pfizer vaccine mm -hmm. that will be coming through. And I think that will give us mm -hmm. a lot of comfort that now we can look at other options if the AstraZeneca is not forthcoming. Mm -hmm. But also to give uh, the public comfort, um, even our current capacity, even just for the vaccine which can be held at 2 to 8 is uh, close to about 5 million uh, doses we can hold. Mm -hmm. And that is about 10% of our capacity right now. 5 million doses? 5 million doses we can hold. Mm -hmm. And that is about a tenth of our capacity. Mm. So we have kept the other capacity for the routine vaccines uh, that we are distributing, um, the measles and, and the rest of them. Mm. And uh, we've earmarked at least a tenth of our capacity uh, for COVID, which can uh, hold up to 5 million doses. So the plan is never really to hold up to 5 million. Uh, mm. we, we, we always want to bring in just enough to vaccinate and then have replenishment. Mm. But that is the scale of the capacity we have at least at, uh, at the central medical store, mm. which is a national medical stores. And we have commensurate capacity as well to distribute that volume within um, one day as well. Mm -hmm. So if uh, push came to shove and we needed to have 5 million out, if we had it in the warehouse, mm -hmm. we also have um, the, the capacity to move it. We have um, a fantastic fleet of uh, cold chain trucks mm -hmm. and these are able to transport these vaccines across the country and we can have this dispatched um, in, in a day. Okay, yeah. well, very important. Uh, the last time we had the Minister of Health here uh, in studios, um, she was asked a question over how to get the public or the private sector uh, to also help in uh, procuring the vaccines from where they, uh, they can. Um, mm. You talked about uh, the uh, private sector players, especially the religious entities. Mm. We think and we know that these have connections they can get at this elsewhere. And uh, the Minister in her response said, I think they're supposed to go through NMS if anybody came through. Mm. I, I just want to know whether you have any who have come uh, to you and, and what that means, uh, what that it simply means does the private sector come with money to you what do they come to you with at nms because we know yes mm. you are um, uh, responsible for all that the procurement uh the storage and, and you know movement and stuff like that have you had any and, and what needs to be done by the private players churches uh, religious organizations mm. and all those others that could be having uh, connections that can help us get the vaccines into the country okay very good so i, I think uh, what we are recognizing here first from what the minister is saying mm. is that um, the best remedy we have for this pandemic is vaccination mm. and uh, i think we must get as many people vaccinated as possible as quickly as possible it's the most cost effective way of managing the pandemic mm. and we have broadened our options of how we can get the vaccine in mm. uh, we are also exploring to see if there are private entities who have um, the means and mechanisms and financing to get the vaccine into the country mm. and to make sure that uh, we can get as much as we need. Uh, we need all the help that we can get. Now, on the logistics of how the vaccine gets into the country and then is distributed where it's going to be used, mm -hmm. I think the guidance we're getting from the ministry, I think which is also very well informed, is that it is better to have a central repository for this vaccine as it comes into the country. Mm -hmm. um, one where we know we have the capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, one where we know we have world-class experience in uh, managing of vaccines mm -hmm. uh, for several years. And uh, then we can be able to monitor 
the quantities that are coming in, mm. the quality of the vaccines that are coming in, and how they are being distributed across the country. It would be very, very risky mm. for us um, in, in our particular setting to have multiple warehouses holding the vaccine. Um, there are so many interests in, uh, in, in the vaccine and uh, um, we doubt if they would have the adequate security, technology, uh, knowledge, the total wherewithal to be able to manage uh, these vaccines and make sure that they are properly stored, transported, and even in case we need even reverse logistics that executed well enough. So to give the country comfort, um, it is important that government takes on this role mm -hmm. and make sure that we hold this vaccine mm -hmm. and uh, as and when they require it, we can have it distributed. I think mm -hmm. it is smart. It's not um, a ploy for NMS to make some extra money, but I think it's in the general interest of the public that uh, the most competent agency in managing of cold chain actually manages the cold chain. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in this fight of COVID-19, um, we have uh, seen or oh, realized that um, we need lots of uh, PPEs, essential medicines, and uh, of mm -hmm. course all these others. And I just want to know how you as NMS um, determine the allocation of all these uh, PPEs mm -hmm. and, and essential medicines. What do you look at in determination of uh, what goes where and how? Well, Jagenda, um, this COVID-19 response has been one truly, um, I would say, national effort. Mm -hmm. We have uh, seen inter-sectoral um, coordination. Uh, we have seen also inter-agency collaboration. And that is what is required mm -hmm. to be able to, 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 to overcome this pandemic. So to appreciate how NMS is, is working to make sure that these are provided, um, you, at the top level there we have the task force being coordinated by the, the OPM. Mm -hmm. And within the health space, you have the ministry taking the lead mm -hmm. in making sure that uh, they can manage at least the health aspects of, of, of the pandemic. So they've set up what we call an um, incident management team mm -hmm. uh, with uh, several pillars inside there sure. that are supposed to support um, the response. One of those key pillars mm -hmm. is logistics uh, that is chaired by National Medical Stores. Mm -hmm. And uh, our role there basically is to make sure we identify the PPEs that are required, quantify them, coordinate with the different agencies. Mm -hmm. Because we, we have so many agencies that are playing a role in, 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 in this fight against COVID. Mm -hmm. It's not only government and national medical stores. We're getting support uh, coming in from UNICEF, from WHO, from WFP, UNHCR. So many private players are, are coming in to provide support. And we don't want people to bring items that are not required or bring items when they're not required. Mm -hmm. um, in a response like this, you want to make sure that you put all your resources um, to best use. Mm -hmm. You don't want to use the precious resources you have and um, deploy them where you will not get a, a return on that investment. Mm -hmm. So the role here of logistics in the Ministry of Health is to make sure that we can coordinate this response. So this very same committee uh, in the Ministry of Health, which again is chaired by, by NMS, receive requests from different facilities. They appraise those requests and see the adequacy of, of those requests. Do they cover IPC? Do they cover um, uh, care and treatment for the patients who are going to be there? Uh, are they in line with the policies that we have that the ministry has set out uh, for protection of health workers and for treatment of, uh, of patients? And then that informed decision is an instruction that is sent to national medical stores, is sent maybe to, to WHO or UNICEF or any other agency that is supporting the response. So there is a lot of interagency coordination um, at the level of the Ministry of Health and also NMS is taking part in that. So we, we are reliant on the decisions of that technical team um, in the Ministry of Health to determine what is most appropriate to send where. Mm -hmm. So that will be informed in a big way by surveillance data. Mm -hmm. We want to know where are the most patients, where is the disease most prevalent, and also where we're having the most, uh, the, the most risk mm -hmm. in terms of the numbers of, of, of healthcare workers at the different levels of care. Mm -hmm. So all these things come together very well, and uh, that is how we determine what quantities are going to be done. So mm -hmm. when those instructions later come to NMS, then we do the needful and make sure we can fill those orders as quickly as possible and see if we can provide our frontline workers at least with uh, the resources they need to be able to mount a reasonable response to this pandemic. Very good. Yeah. So how has um, uh, COVID itself uh, affected your routine supplies of medicines across the country? Because we've been with COVID here for now. It's coming to two years, close to. Yeah. And, and, and things have changed and been affected grossly. We, we just need to know because you are still in this business and you mm. still have to operate. But how has it affected your routine supplies? and? Um, your, your operations in as far as medicines? Our, our primary business is the routine distribution of essential medicines. Mm -hmm. uh, but also we have a responsibility 
to respond to public health emergencies. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done so before uh, for Ebola, Marburg, um, cholera, and the outbreaks that come about. But those have normally been small, and we have found it within our means to be able to do this mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. COVID has presented itself in a very different way. This very is um, sustained for a very long period. We're into a second year. We don't think it will end this year. Mm -hmm. And also the scale of um, volumes of, of medicines that we have to move out have actually been quite, uh, quite tremendous. And it's not affecting isolated um, pockets across the country or the globe. It's just basically everywhere. Mm -hmm. So logistically, it presents a very <coughs> unique challenge for us. I think one that we have not experienced before, and even I don't think any other agency has experienced somewhere before. Mm -hmm. So initially, um, at the start of the pandemic, we did see a lot of disruptions on the supply side. Mm, where you had materials coming in in a more organized way, uh, COVID is causing so many disruptions. Um, where you take you probably a month or two to get an item, now it's going to take you a little bit longer. Mm. And um, very, very fortunately, I would say we had been working very closely with the ministry on the development of a medical, medical countermeasures plan. Mm. Uh, medical countermeasures are those um, equipment, PPEs that we use in uh, emergency responses. Mm. So we were at least having the framework at the back of our minds of how we thought the country should be able to respond mm. to a public health emergency of this kind. So there were disruptions upstream, um, definitely, but also um, as an organization, um, we are not immune to the effects of, 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 of COVID. Um, we saw the government uh, put in place um, restrictions on movement and some of our staff do live far away. Mm -hmm. So access to work also becomes a little bit of a challenge. Working hours had to be reduced because it would not be very easy to work at night. So you are under pressure mm -hmm. to do the routine and then also have the surge operation to make sure you can provide over and above. And I think we adapted very quickly to make sure we had that. We got, um, I think we're deploying more than 4,000 square meters of space additional just to manage the COVID supplies that we had. Uh, we had to get some extra personnel to make sure that that function in the entity also works well. And then also find very clever ways of making sure our staff can be available to work uh, without the risk of them getting infected. Because if we say it have infections within uh, the organization would be very, very difficult. So again, yes, it was a challenge, okay. but I think we have continued to provide uh, the medicines on routine basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, the buffers that we have held in our warehouse have allowed us to ride the supply disruptions that we have seen. Mm -hmm. And I, I think very good justification in, in making sure that government continues to operate uh, Central Medical Store mm -hmm. and maintain control mm -hmm. of uh, such key uh, life-saving commodities. We've also had instances where we've um, seen drugs moving from public hospitals to uh, private clinics, to private hospitals, private facilities of juggernauts and the quarries of this world. And mm -hmm. uh, we, we keep wondering, yeah. when you as national medical stores mm -hmm. uh, take medicines, for example, from uh, the central medical stores to a facility in, in, in Arua, in, in Soroti and elsewhere, do you follow up to actually know what happens? Or when you take them to the facility, store them there, mm -hmm. and then you move away? Because uh, the other day we hear, we see people uh, running with that. And I just want to know the prevalence of that and how much you are typically doing Mm. Uh, to save this country and to save us from uh, public medicines that go into hospitals mm. and are uh, nicked into uh, private facilities. Jagenda, I, I think that is a, a challenge that I think we are all becoming very alive to. Mm. And I think um, even with the goings on with COVID, we have, this has come more to light now that the health sector, mm. I think, is getting a little bit more prominence, I think, in the news. Um, stories related to medicines, I think, are, are, are of interest right now. Mm. But I, I think uh, there is a certain section of, uh, of Ugandans, as someone put one time, who are yet to be baptized, who still see it fit and proper mm -hmm. to take commodities which have been provided to a health facility mm -hmm. at no charge and uh, take them out and see if they can profiteer off of it. It mm -hmm. is something that we know to be happening mm -hmm. and uh, we're working very hard to stop it. But from the side of NMS, um, there's a bit of a challenge and uh, because our mandate is clearly for the procurement, storage and mm -hmm. distribution of essential medicines. Our clients are the health facilities. Those health facilities have accounting officers and they have mechanisms within there to make sure that the medicines or resources that we have given them are appropriately Keep used there and, of course, and accounted for. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very difficult to overreach uh, and go in there and try and do some of these things. But we do get the reports mm -hmm. and uh, over the years we have uh, chosen to start working with some strategic partners. So from time to time you will hear that uh, the health monitoring unit has uh, been able to identify some people who have been taking these commodities. So those are people we have been working with for a very long time to make sure that we can identify those people who are moving those products out of the public system and perhaps trying to profiteer off of them. Mm -hmm. We've also been working a lot with uh, the CID to make sure that we can also prosecute 
them so that uh, at least we can set an example. Mm -hmm. That if you take medicines meant uh, for for people of this country, mm -hmm. and government has already paid for them, and paid for them through taxpayers' money. So mm -hmm. you, you can't ask people to pay twice, pay mm -hmm. the tax and then pay for the medicine. That is very unfair. And it's normally the people who are most in need who are actually taken advantage of. It is completely unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And it's something we're working very hard to make sure that we can address. But also to support those agencies who are trying to nip the bud there and make sure that uh, we don't have any proliferation of these commodities outside uh, the public uh, sector supply chain. We, we went ahead and we have uh, conspicuously marked um, all our medicines that we procure using GOU money. So mm -hmm. you will see very clear labeling, government of Uganda, mm -hmm. not for sale. Mm -hmm. So the simple thing there is that if somebody is caught with these commodities, uh, and, and, the expectation, it it, and the expectation is that Jagger will be so patriotic to take a look at this and say, "This is government of Uganda." Yes, Don't please. sell it to me. Exactly, uh, exactly. But, but a desperate Jagger will just just say, "Can I come make and come Then pay, you know, and it's written on label, government yeah. of Uganda, not for sale. You should, you should mm. not, you should not pay for it. And mm. uh, whoever is trying to sell it to you, Jagger, you should actually find a way of making sure that you notify mm. the local authorities because that is how we start clamping down on this. And it is one of the reasons that you were asking me in the first place that the medicines are not there because. Mm. So much has been provided. We have so many disease programs which are fully funded where we actually bring in more than the actual cases mm. or that are actually reported. And you wonder where does the medicine go sometimes. Mm. So it's some of these areas here I think we need to all be aware. Mm. I think uh, perhaps as we live through COVID, mm. people are being more health conscious. Mm. And uh, I think that is uh, very important for, for all of us. So people will take note here in and know that all these medicines marked like this are actually provided for free. Mm. And uh, I think we shall start seeing people being more demanding mm. for services at those points of care mm. and not just accept that they ought to pay for medicines which they have already paid for through taxation. Do you as NMS do some impromptu visits to health facilities uh, to mm. actually find out and ascertain whether medicines are in hospitals? For example, when you deliver medicines to a particular facility, government mm. facility anywhere, do you do those impromptu visits to actually just find out? I, I tried it out myself when I went to, uh, to, to, to UCI, uh, mm -hmm. the, the Cancer Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just wanted to go there and, and, and find out. Mm. Uh, and, and they gave me a whole list of medicines mm. and there was just one particular medicine that wasn't with them. Mm -hmm. And they told me, well, these are about 47 medicines here. But, but if Okwale comes yeah, and he wants specifically this number 41 mm. and it's not here or, or what I can go to Freddy and say there, there's no medicine in hospital I went there but there's no medicine mm. and now that's another thing but mm. you do those impromptu visits to actually find out and secondly is it surprising when somebody writes to you one DHO writes and says uh, you, you gave us medicines quartem or so whatever it is but, but it, it's out of stock now uh, b before the next supply comes in mm. does it surprise you that um uh, they've outused all the medicines I I in a period of time. Is it surprising that um, yeah, all yeah, people yeah. got sick and, and <laughs> <laughs> they consumed all these medicines? Again, <laughs> it's quite shocking. Sometimes we've, we've actually gotten reports like that. Mm. You make a, a supply which is reasonable and uh, there is no and indication. And you, you, you expect it to run for maybe whole year. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. And within a very short period, you find that it has actually been exhausted. But in those instances, we've always had our ears on the ground uh, because we have a whole department that interfaces with, uh, with our clients. And uh, they try to make sure that they keep in touch with them, mm. appreciate their mobility in those areas there and their consumption patterns. Mm. So when we get anomalies like this, we, we normally investigate. But sometimes you even get more arousing information. Mm. Uh, but we can't go there as ourselves, as, mm. as NMS. We normally try and work with uh, the police if we believe there has been foul play. Mm. So that is normally what we do. We, we, we quarry can't go and arrest somebody. Mm. I, I am not a, a police officer at no, all. Not. I, and I shouldn't be doing that. Mm. Uh, so what we do is we go to the relevant authority, the police, and we tell them that we suspect mm. that there is foul play here. Mm. And uh, let's go have another look. And mm. uh, very often we do find that our our, our fears are actually um, on the ground, mm -hmm. and uh, we've been able to apprehend a few individuals. But again, again, this is only a symptom mm -hmm. of, of something much deeper. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we can't be everywhere. We can't pick up every um, hint that uh, medicines have been pilfered. Mm -hmm. And that is why we, are, we, we, we try as much as possible to 
put the messaging out there mm -hmm. that uh, government is providing commodities free of charge. So if mm -hmm. you go into a public facility, please demand that uh, it be provided for free. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can start from there. And I think uh, we can find that uh, we can cover a lot of the need in the country in terms of what is required okay. for the provision of essential medicines and health supplies. Uh, w one of those last questions from you, uh, from mm -hmm. me to you, is um, l let's talk about the space itself. How much mm -hmm. space do you have at Entebbe and how much space do you also have at the different facilities where you drop uh, these medicines? Uh, do you have a sufficient place, uh, sufficient space uh, for storage? Mm -hmm. In uh, regional hospitals, for example, in uh, the other public hospitals, uh, do we have enough space uh, to, to keep the medicines or we're also grappling with that challenge? No, at uh, National Medical Stores, we, for example, we discussed cold chain, mm -hmm. uh, actually that we, we have appropriate space. Um, we also just in the final stages of completing a brand new warehouse in, in Kajansi. Mm -hmm. It's going to give us about three, uh, four times the amount of space oh. that we have. So if you look at cold chain, for example, mm -hmm. our capacity at Entebbe is about 800 cubic meters. Mm -hmm. um, in Kajansi, it's going to be about 4,000 plus. So mm -hmm. you can see that's uh, several folds mm -hmm. more. More than what Yeah, so we're planning for the future. Uh, we believe it will help us cover uh, the midterm, but even the, the ultimate long term. Mm -hmm. Even in terms of the actual space we have um, on the floor, um, we are finding that uh, we have approximately uh, 12,500 pallet locations um, available to us um, in, in, in Entebbe. And uh, when we go to Kajansi, we will be adding on an additional 1,000. So you can see we're not just looking to cover the needs that we have right now, okay. but we're also trying to cover the needs for the future. Mm -hmm. But our operation is scalable, and mm -hmm. that's what logistics and operation is all about. Mm -hmm. So w if there is a need for the space, we scale it to match that, that, that need. Okay. But um, the smart thing we try to do is not just to have as much space, because that becomes mm -hmm. very expensive. And if we're expensive, the amount of money available for medicines goes mm -hmm. down. So we try and be as efficient as possible. So we, we, we try and see how we can be clever in the way we schedule deliveries from our suppliers and how we can schedule deliveries also for our clients on the other side. Okay. Um, on the side of, of, of the facilities, um, I think we, we, we still have a bit of a challenge, I think. Uh, they, many of them have good space, some still do not. Um, for the larger facilities like uh, the regional referrals, um, the volumes and the budget they have, okay. uh, I think means that they cannot take stock for two months. So we give them every month. Okay. So, so that, that, that works out easily. So mm -hmm. you solve a, a space problem just by scheduling the commodities to, to go there a little bit more frequently. Mm -hmm. Th that's like for the larger ones like Mulago uh, and those. So the, the smaller ones, if they, they can take commodities, which they can take in two months, we schedule it that way. So we try and, and use um, some logic mm -hmm. in the way we provide the commodities to make sure that space uh, as a problem is, is negated. Okay. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much, Mr. Kwari. Your final mm. message from your heart uh, mm. in just one minute to the public. Ah, okay. Uh, mm. Thank you very much, Jagenda. <laughs> 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 I, I think, uh, mm. I think uh, what can I say? Mm. Um, we are distributing vaccines. Sure. Yeah, um, just uh, on Monday, we distributed um, all the vaccines that we had available, mm. and uh, these are now available in, in the districts okay. across the country. I think my message is that uh, if you're eligible, please go get vaccinated. Mm. I mean, uh, it's the cheapest and safest way we can protect ourselves mm. and our loved ones. Mm. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much, Mr. Polo Kwari, the Chief Stores and Operations Officer from the National Medical Stores. Thank you so much for having allowed to join us this morning here on um, a Good Morning Uganda Extra. And I think uh, when we find time next time again, yeah. Uh, please, uh, we'll call on you and come back and talk to us because we need to hear loads and more uh, from you and from um, uh, the central stores there. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, when you go back, send my greetings to uh, Ndugu Kamavari, right. uh, my very good friend here. I remember one quotation from him when I hosted him in studios here. He said, you have no right to demand for Kwatem <laughs> if you deliberately <laughs> refuse to sleep at a mosquito net. If government gives you a mosquito net and you say you will not sleep at it, you have no right to actually say, uh, I, 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 I need my Kwatem. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I think we're, we're <laughs> very good at we, we advocating give a net for to save the quantum so when you say don't need the net because it, it gives me all this warmth and all stuff, mm. and stuff like that then you have no right mm -hmm. to say mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes yes well to ndugu kamavari thank you so much and of course thank you so much um in ndugu quite here my name is jagan i'll stop it here yeah, uh, for tonight and of course uh, wishing all um all the best for tonight uh charles dong Tho will be coming on with um behind the headlines but of course chelsea is also playing <laughs> against <laughs> 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 <laughs>